Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. This is Alexander Williamson, and today we are going to be talking about slime coats. So this is an awesome system in fish. And while the rest of the world is kind of concerned about illness and uh, pathogens and all sorts of things like that, I thought it would be a good time to discuss what exactly a slime coat is in your fish. And yes, all your pet fish, all fish in general, have slime coats. And, you know, some fish don't have uh, fins. Some fish don't even uh, use their gills. There's labyrinth fish that can breathe air, you know, like bettas and uh, lungfish and things like that. And, uh, you know, they're, it, it's hard to pin down what exactly makes a fish a fish. However, slime coats are something that are present in every single species of fish known to man uh, and women and however you identify yourself. So, let's talk about slime coats. This is going to be one of those secret history nerdy episodes. And, uh, you know, I could really get into the chemical and molecular... Uh, structuring and uh, the the biology of this, but this will be a cursory look at slime coats because it is a huge topic, and I think once you watch this, you will learn a lot about how to treat your fish, why you're treating your fish the way you are, and uh, things that can be done to help your fish, um, or why you're seeing effects that you're seeing, why when the slime when a when a fish is rubbing itself against something because it has a parasite or or you know an issue going on and there's no slime coat there well, why is it uh you know why were you why will you why why ugh, whoa tongue tied so why will your fish uh hang out at the bottom of its tank or towards the top um you know uh what what are these slime coats for and and how do they differ and they are an incredible and amazing uh, thing. So let's hop right in. So first of all, fish and their skin, their, their protective layers. So let's work over here with any drawings. And here we'll do a list of the awesome things that slime coats uh, do for fish. So with fish, you've got your scales. Uh, we'll just draw this out, pardon these quick doodle type drawings, but you got your scales and then under that you've got a layer of skin and the scales are actually kind of like an exterior layer of skin and then underneath that you have a, a layer of daughter cells and uh, proteins and basically things that we have on our inside too. So we would keep these in our deeper layers of skin. We have dead cells on the outside and scales are kind of like that in that they are they are uh, usually like keratin or cartilage or some other hardened uh, material that's not necessarily alive. Now it grows uh, out of living um orifices basically each scale and it is a type of armor and some fish have uh, more scales and uh, others don't have scales they have basically like a rough skin kind of like a shark um, that's like a matrix of this stuff rather than individual armoring plates but underneath all that in all fish you've got the skin and so you've got this thick live layer with all sorts of arteries and uh well, not arteries, but capillaries, blood vessels, things like that, that supply underneath the scales uh, all sorts of goodies. So if we're looking at the skin, and these are the scales here, right here you've got a lot of cells that are either non-organic or they're, or, well, sorry, they're organic, but they're not alive and and functioning necessarily as a moving part of the system. Just like we have dead skin cells at the top, they basically are being shed as new new cells are coming in. And those come out in between the, 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 um, the scales or they come out just on their own into the water. But you could see that this is probably a pretty bumpy ride uh, to have just these plates when you're trying to glide through the water. So one of the first things that that uh, 
this this layer does is it basically so if we're looking at the skin and we've got the the deeper dermis and then the superficial dermis which this is dead cells and little proteins and all sorts of stuff like that well then there are these little uh docking areas in the skin and there are also little glands that so under here would be a gland this is deeper in the fish's flesh um if we're talking about like corydoras for instance so up here are the scales obviously um and if we're talking about like a corydora they have a venom gland so that will go through both layers of the the uh the the skin and that will be under the armpit, basically, under their fin, their pectoral fin. And when they squeeze or constrict this, they, it allows them to actually put out a toxin into the water. And many fish have this. So in this layer here, there's lots of important stuff going on. So there's all these little areas. So some of them are for docking. So this little keyhole-shaped thing in the skin will only dock with certain proteins. So only this circle of that specific size has the receptors and it will dock in here. And then that will uh, be kind of a key to the doorway of inside the cells. So then if there's tannins in the water or there's salt in the water, this doorway, depending on which organ it is, and I could do a whole video for 20 minutes on each of these things, but one of the things that that uh, the the slime coat above here does is it basically uh, transports all the functionality of what's going on underneath the scales and things into a thin layer over the scales that coats the scales, and it's a viscous uh, material. Uh, basically, it's cell protoplasm that is. Uh, a lubricant and actually it's a polyglycol and protein based uh, mix of chemicals and that means that um, you know we use polyglycols actually um, and things like glycerin and, and motor oil and uh, lubrication for um, factories and engines and things like that so it's it's very very hydrophilic um, in, or sorry, hydrophobic, which means that water, when you've got your water molecule, H2O, and it's floating here, it hits the, the line of this slime coat, and the slime coat may be, this isn't structurally accurate, but instead of on some people, hey, we have a little bug joining us. Um, so instead of like human skin, we've got all these micro cracks and holes and, and things. And so our skin, while it protects us, water can actually, you know, this molecule can easily lodge into here and we can get our fingers pruning, um, as it actually pulls water out of our own body, uh, to try to equalize the salinity and the water, um, pH and everything. Water wants to equalize. And so in fish, this slime coat actually, the on a molecular le le level, water hits this and just glides right off. It, it hits this, there's nowhere for it to fit, and it actually pushes it away. And part of this can be through uh, ions, and then the rest can just be structural. But they have seen, so the first thing we're going to say is for uh, movement, movement, and, uh, well, I guess it would be uh, hydrodynamics, hydrodynamics, because this has been shown to give up to a 35% boost in how fast fish can move through the water. It, it's like greasing them up and so they can go through the water. Now at the same time that it does this, you obviously know that uh, your, your slime coat on your fish is basically an immune system. You probably know that. And so whereas we have immune systems within us, within our blood, uh, within mucus also, uh, fish in their slime coat 
they also have uh, this stuff that we call mucin. So mucin is a chemical that is produced in glands. And just like I showed you here, there's all sorts of uh, little little uh, doorways that some allow you know nutrients in, some allow salt in, some only let salt out. It really depends. There's all of these different functionalities within that skin, and then it all all those chemicals and things can hang out in here in the slime coat and in between the scales and then in this layer of protective skin, which basically this is just an extra layer of dead skin and daughter cells that are ready, when I say daughter cells, that are ready to fix. So say um, a fish comes and takes a bite out of that, that the, the um, outside skin of another fish or a parasite does. Well, these cells here, in the mucin, they form with water. They're hydrophilic, so that means they like water. They pair up with water, they bond, and, and when they get together with water, they make something that we know also, which is mucus. And that basically, when it, when it fills in here, it's going to take these globs, these sticky globs uh, of the proteins... And anything bad, any little viruses or fungi or um, even just dead cells like dead flesh, it's going to start making a coating of that in here, and it's going to push it out. Then next comes in from this deeper layer, the slime coat will kind of protect this area, and when it protects these this area it puts that coating of slime in there so that nothing's coming and going it actually is a layer that keeps almost everything out then from the inside white blood cells red blood cells uh, coagulants so if if our if uh, little capillaries have been severed and it's bleeding things like that um, it can then uh, put all those cells in here and fill it up so then once that's done and there's little uh, cells in here, the slime coat kind of covers that and it's like a scab in humans. So this is true of a lot of foreign uh, invaders on the fish's body. Um, this is kind of how it works. And once these start to fill in, then the proper stem cells, their undifferentiated cells in quotation marks, many, many different kinds of cells will say, okay, well, we need to start growing scales back here, and we need to uh, push the dead cells from in here up. The mucus can go back out into here, and so on and so forth. Now, this mucus has evolved, just like when we get allergies and we've got junk in our nose. Mucus, we get snot, we get spit, and it, it surrounds those bad particles and we spit it out, and it basically traps those things, and we get rid of it. So it's doing the same thing for fish. Uh, it, it basically is like the skin's ability to sneeze and have a runny nose is one major functionality of it. The next one I'm going to say that's very important uh, is that it allows uh, clotting, and then it allows uh, more, like I said, lubrication. Uh, so let's put that uh, the lubrication goes in with the hydrodynamics and movement, as I said, can increase how fast they go by 35%, especially in tetras and, and little um, keratins, keratins and things like that, keratins, uh, keratins, fish, uh, and a lot of nano danios and things like that. It's very, very good for that. Now, also, at the same time, you're, it's just amazing all the things it does. So we can say that it clots and protects wounds. And the other thing it can do at the same time is a lot of times once it's damaged, it will trigger glands deep under the skin, down in the flesh. Sometimes they go all the way into the fat, like venom glands and things like that. But so there's these glands here that, that serve all the way up and, you know, they, they flow all throughout the skin and then they come out in between the scales. But they can send pheromones...
I might be spelling that wrong off the top of my head. Uh, pheromones? Whatever. Not worried about it. Uh, but they can send pheromones, which can either say, help, I've been bitten, and basically these are, in, in animals, pheromones are a lot more, they say a lot more than in humans. We have pheromones too, and you may like or dislike the way someone bo someone's body odor smells. For instance, um, you know, if you don't like someone's body odor, there's a good chance that their DNA is very similar to yours or that it's not compatible. They've found that uh, birth defects amongst people who don't like each other's body odor are much higher than in people who uh, say that the body odor of one another is not a not necessarily offensive. They may not love it, but it's not offensive. It's not like, wow, that's nasty. So it can send out a, a little alarm saying, help, and then in the water, these little little uh, cells and molecules can go out, and other fish will sense them. And in the skin here, there's little docking receptors, also in the glands of the fish's nose and its mouth where it tastes and things like that. Every species has a little bit different setup, but that can tell it, we need to get out of here. We're getting attacked by parasites. We're getting attacked by um, actually things biting us. And the level at which this is communicated is still being researched very heavily. Uh, and it's really interesting um, what these chemical signals can say. Now, at the same time, believe it or not, these, th these signals can also say food, safety. So these same chemicals, if everything's peachy and this system's working well... It can put out uh, relaxing hormones and uh, pheromones that say, hey, I'm ready to mate. I'm ready to do things. And the ability of these little particles to go out into the water without just disappearing or bonding to other things, they actually get encircled in the mucus. And then these molecules or globs of molecules go out and then another fish, this is my terrible fish, says, hmm, here, it needs a nose. So the fish smells it, and it's like, yeah, I need to go find her. So then it goes back, and it finds, you know, the female fish putting out those lovely scents. Now, the other cool thing about this is the estrogen, the testosterone, things that we also have, this can be expressed even through the slime coat and through the excretions of fish. And so this comes to uh, another thing that it can do, which is super important, and that is osmo uh, regulation. So osmo regulation and uh, gas transfer. Gas transfer. That's saying so, like. Say there's too much ammonia in the water. This will form a more protective barrier, and fish need to be, you know, getting water and drinking and things like that. And some fish absorb it through their body, through their through this system here, their skin and their mucus. Others take it through the gills. Most do take pr most of it from the gills, and actually they take it. They take you know oxygen and things. But if there's ammonia or there's too much CO2 or nitrogen, uh, the, there are little particles that can say, hey, let's gum up this system in the gills, and that slime coat extends to the inside or into their mouth, and it can protect them. Just like with the toxins, it can also, this slime coat can go into their mouths and say, hey guys, we have a major uh, problem. We're eating something that's not good for us. It has uh, poison in it, and it can actually uh, use little white blood cells. So say there's so in the fish, it's, it's eaten a chunk of something, and it's something that's not good for it. And so we have these white blood cells. They're called phagocytes, if anybody's interesting, but interested. But they come hunting. They can move wherever they want. Like they have little flagellas, little, uh, little swimmy deals uh, that allow them to move rather than just uh, be pulled towards things ionically or just kind of circulating in general. But 
once they get in, so say this is the fish's mouth, and this is way out of proportion, but this is the fish's mouth, it's eating something, and it realizes, crap, that's poison. So on a tiny level, the slime coat, by the corner of their mouth, they have more glands usually. Sometimes they have glands all through here. Uh, with with uh, catfish and things, their onodontodes have all sorts of sensory glands. But they can send in the white blood cells from their dermis without bleeding out. They can send plasma. They can send white blood cells. They can send red blood cells. And they can send these attack cells. And they can break down things by, say this is the dangerous particle right here. This thing comes... It circles it. The next step, it circles it completely. These parts close around. And then it says, all right, this thing uh, on a small level, so say, say this is the poison and it has little receptors that are shaped like this on the outside. So then it will read this and it will say, okay, so this is the shape that the receptor needs to dock in order to hurt us. So it will then produce a ton of these little shapes in here in its own cell and it will spit these out and give them to all the other cells around that are hunting and destroying and then it can actually find the poison and cure it by rendering it bonded and, and harmless just like when we dechlorinate water. So I know that's kind of a, a rough doodle but I hope that's interesting. So and I hope that makes sense. Now, speaking of the mouth and food and realizing uh, toxins in the water, um, you know, things like uh, salt in the water. So this osmoregulation, freshwater fish have much saltier bodies on the inside, just like we have tears that are salty. If we jump in a freshwater lake, the water wants to have the same level of salt inside and outside our bodies that's why our fingers prune and things like that uh and so what it can do is it can allow uh and decide how much salt and is allowed in and out of this fish's body same thing with the gills uh and its digestive system now a fish uh, when it eats something, it's a it has a mucus lining, a slime coat all the way through its digestive system, so it can it can actually protect it. So if it's too salty in the water, uh, saltwater fish out in the oceans, they actually have way less salt in their bodies, and so they don't want to be taking in more salt. So they have little special uh, docking particles that say, uh, no, we can't take in more salt. We're only putting out more salt. But we do want the water, and so they'll allow the water in. So this is osmoregulation and uh, sodium regulation is really important. And then also salt is also another uh, sodium ions are how nerves talk to one another. So nerves in a lot of cells, uh, salt is a big part of that. So they can absorb salt from their food. Uh, from plankton, from, you know, whatever they're eating, whether it's a big fish eating other fish that have eaten plankton and other small things, they can absorb it that way when they eat, but they can also regulate this through their slime coat. Now, the other thing that it can do is it can, it can gum up. It can add, uh, basically, it gets it from tannins in the water. It can add proteins, and so instead of being this nice, slick, uh, this remember this everything's bouncing off this it's just going smooth in the water uh, it can start making clumps like this that break off and this is rich proteins just like mammals make milk in some species of fish it's actually food so babies will eat that so like on a discus or on Asian catfish a lot of fish will feed their babies through their slime coat. So that's why it's important that it's healthy. Now, uh, they can also put other nutrients into this. There are um, pheromone reactions that go on that allow the baby to say, I don't have enough iron. And then the systems in the body can say, all right, let's regulate the iron. Let's put more iron into this uh, mucus if they have it. Uh, and so it's just really incredible system how that works. Uh, so, you know, it's taking care of wounds, clots. Now, the other thing that it's doing it 
along with food is with little fish like little gobies and uh, wrasses particularly, lampreys, things like that, uh, uh, nurse uh, fishes, I should say, in salt water that like hang on sharks and, you know, clean them. The other thing it does is it can it can say, let's send out some of our slime coat and these little dots are plankton. So let's in, let's make a chain. Let's make a fat and protein chain, a lipid chain, and let's encircle these things and say this is this is the fish's skin right here still, and scales, and it's putting out this chain, and it literally encircles all these little plankton and. Uh, it can it can be micro crustaceans it can be all sorts of stuff and it gets it into clumps and then this can move along that slime coat layer and in some fish it literally pushes the the slime coat along through glands and things uh to their mouth and they eat this and then they reuse these cells and the protein but then they're able to get all the nutrients from this also, that kind of is how they make a big enough clump for uh, baby uh, fish when they're feeding off the slime coat. Now, while all of this is going on, immunity is conferred through that. So just like I showed you, poisons can be rendered uh, not poisonous by binding to them and things like that. Like if there's a neurotoxin or something, they ate some sort of... Uh, you know, sea urchin or some sort of other fish like uh, a, a cory. So say a big catfish ate a, a pleco, ate a cory catfish that was poisonous, had a barb in it. Now its body and its blood cells are going to deal with that one way, but its slime coat also in the water will sense that and try to say, we need to make these. So for the rest of that fish's life, this is just like us with viruses, uh, it is ready with these, these, uh, this thing is called the antigen, whatever is causing problems, and these are the antibodies. And so the antibodies are always ready being made in these big uh, white blood cells. There's a bunch of different functions of white blood cells moving through uh, the, the system, both through veins and capillaries, and then also through the slime coat, and it is always on the hunt for that. Now, it can pass on, which is really cool, the immunity to its young. So this immunity, if you watch, for instance, angelfish or cribs rubbing their bellies all over where there's these glands in the skin, uh, all over their eggs, they're putting a coat. So say they lay eggs on a surface. When they're rubbing their belly on, on this, on these eggs they've laid, the terrible angelfish. I hope I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, so it's it's rubbing its belly on these eggs, and they get this slime coat, but they're also getting all the proteins. They're getting nourishment, and then they're also getting uh, various things that have worked in the course of evolution and in the course of the fish's life. Uh, so say, you know, there's little water leeches. Well, maybe water leeches don't like zinc. I don't know. I'm making something up. So they've learned we need to create zinc when we face this threat. And the way the threat is marked is by these cells have all these receptors and they float around and then they tell the other cells, hey, this, this threat we've seen before is back. Make zinc. And so they can actually confer millions of years of immunity to their eggs uh, and they can kind of leave that over it plus it's food it's protein it's in the eggs uh, when the fish hatch they'll eat a lot of times this slime uh, and that's pretty awesome now the other thing it can use them for is defense so as i said uh uh Man, my handwriting is getting sloppier and sloppier. But the poison gland in, say, a Corydora, it can spray out a cloud, uh, and then the the uh, biofilm will also have uh, an amount of this that would be irritating, agitating to anything trying to eat it. But in, say, hagfish or lampreys, 
uh, as well as many, many other fish, they can create so much mucus with the mucin in their in their uh, in their slime coat that basically uh, they're so slimy and sticky that it gums up any chance of a fish trying to eat it. Uh, try to hold it. Look up videos of hagfish. They're just covered in this gross, thick snot that that just I mean, oh, it's a mess. And it allows them, one, to move through the water faster. And then, two, it gums up the system and it tastes gross. And uh, basically, it's like slug slime, you know? And it causes other fish to just say, you know what? Forget that. So the other thing, while it's it can be slimy and it can cause make a layer, basically, that's protective, uh, and then lubricating on the outside, the other thing it can do is make cocoons... So, for for instance, little uh, mud skippers, and for lungfish in Africa, uh, for killifish eggs and things that have to dry out or be in mud puddles, this stuff can actually uh, it dehydrates slightly, and it forms usually several layers with water trapped. I don't know why water is this shape in my drawing. This is the water in between. It's trapped between fatty lipids, so it can't be used. And it actually can allow the fish to go into suspended animation. It creates a wall, keeping the fish moist. And then there are little uh, channels, which are lined by teeny tiny little things, uh, little molecules, and then also organelles and cells that allow either salt or oxygen or um, CO2, so CO2 can go out, oxygen can come in. This is usually more on the gills, but it also happens on the slime coat in some species. So it can make the, allow them to make a cocoon. And the other thing that this cocoon, or this gooiness that the hagfish have as defense, so back to, as I said, uh, remember we talked about bettas and labyrinth fish at the very beginning. The other awesome thing it can do is the fish can secrete this and it can make bubble nests. So we've got little eggs hanging out here. And your betta is laying them. I don't, man, this is bad. Sorry, guys. I'm doing quick quick drawings. But your betta is blowing bubbles. And you got these bubbles that are covered in mucus. And it can actually raise some of the eggs out of the water because of the surface tension. But it also keeps them moist. It confers that immunity. And it's food for them to eat when they come out, as well as their yolk sac, um, which I think is very, very uh, cool. Now, uh, you know, discus, as I said, they've got this same food on the outside. It's now being seen that more and more fish, uh, maybe if it's not even food, it's conferring all these uh, antibodies that protect them from pathogens and antigens, from virus, bacteria, um, fungi, they can pass that on by rubbing against the eggs. And then when the fish hatch out of these little eggs, they have to make it out through that slime coat that's over the egg nest. So as they come through, it inoculates their own slime coat. And by the time they're out, they've got their own little superpower shield. So in another video, we'll get into how we can help maintain this slime coat, which basically does more things than you could shake a stick at. Um, you know, these are the key kind of sections of things. But, you know, as we said, let's go over it real quick. It, it, it can uh, regulate the exchange of salts and nutrients, both in and out. It can put out little, um, I guess, chemicals that would make parasites leave. Parasites hate it. Uh, it can also put out pheromone warnings out deep into the water. Some of them are so intense that a, a bigger fish or a shark may have it in its mouth. And all of a sudden, like with a hagfish, it's going to be like, this is disgusting. This slime coat, it is repulsive and it will let it go right there. So that's another awesome thing. And then as it's regulating these things, it can also put out the pheromones and say, help, I need help from my friends. And the other fish, it will trigger them to make things like steroids and adrenaline, and they'll come back and they will help out. 
uh, in numbers if they're schooling fish, or if they're they're not, you know, if they're very uh, prey fish, they know that they, they can peace out, they can get out of there. Uh, also, it can tell them about uh, genetic um, similarities, so that it can reduce the effects of inbreeding because fish will be repelled by uh, too similar of genes in their slime coat, and so it can cut down on that. It can let gases in and out of the fish's skin. It can allow wounds to heal. It can get, you know, things like pus, mucus, all sorts of bad things that build up when you have an infection. While all these white blood cells are able to use it as a highway, a slick highway, and they can come at it from the wound if it's deep enough, then it allows it all to encircle it and break pieces out and send them off into the nether regions. Also, it can be food for baby fish. Like I said, it confers that immunity in everything that it's learned for generation after generation. It's a lubricant that helps the fish move through the water 35% faster uh, in some studies. Some have said more. Uh, on average, it's more like 20 to 25% for most fish. But others, they really count on that. Tunas and things like that are already hydrodynamic or aerodynamic, however you want to look at it. Um, but they, they really count on that. And once you see like white blotchiness or cloudiness, it can be signs that there's an issue with this slime coat or mucus layer on the fish. And that basically strips it of a lot of this functionality. And so you can do things like giving them salt baths, which will try to re-equalize the distribution and either produce more of the slime coat or basically uh, just seal off and equalize the water so that they're not trying to go back and forth. And freshwater fish, a little bit of salt, not too much. If you can get it near what the, the balance is in the fish and the pH, then it can kind of act as a faux slime coat for a while. So you can do that. You can also use tannins and things like that that actually build up with these proteins and these lipids they're, they allow the fish to absorb from the outside, unlike we do. Uh, I guess we do that with sunlight and vitamin D and things, but this actually can absorb. The, the skin is an organ. I mean, our skin absorbs toxins and oxygen and things like that too, but not at a level to this extreme underwater uh, in, in a layer, uh, in, a, in a medium of water where so many things can bond with water uh, or dilute into water and then attack the fish. This is just great. All right, guys. So basically, it can help it make cocoons. It can help it make nests. It can allow it to stick particles of sand together and build uh, all sorts of nests. So like cribs or um, if, if a fish like an angelfish or a uh, cichlid needs to stick their babies to uh, the underside of a leaf uh, while they're in their little wriggler phase, or the eggs, it acts as cement. That mu mucin adds other lipids to it, and j instead of just being like a snotty mucus, it can actually harden underwater, like cyanoacrylate does, like superglue does, and it can cause a cement bonding. So there are just countless reasons why a slime coat is so important for your fish. I hope this was kind of fascinating. Uh, interesting to you guys. I know this is nerdy, but I wanted to get back to this, uh, but also be a little bit uh, relevant to how things are working in our own bodies and, and how we're all fighting things off. So I hope this was a break from worrying about your own immunity and things like that. And if you like this kind of content, if you like it when I research these things and get this detailed, I could get a heck of a lot more detail talking about each one of these things for 30 minutes and all the different chemicals and uh, salt ion, uh, potassium ion channels that are used for communicating lock and key, how to let things out, and not in, so forth and so on. But if you've made it this far in the video, please like, subscribe. If you want to really help me out because I'm on lockdown at home with lupus, I wish I had a slime coat. Instead, I just have this dry skin that is acting out because I had to get off my lupus meds for for uh, my own immunity sake, uh, help me out on Patreon or support me by sharing the video. I know a lot of you people are having tough times right now too. 
uh, aren't working a nine to five or whatnot. And so you can also support me through my art if you want to get something. You know, you don't want to just throw uh, your money into a channel from some guy, you know, who's far away. But on Patreon, you can get things like 24-hour uh, assistance if you need help, how to take care of your fish or you're having a problem with something or you need an opinion on what fish go together and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's there's some cool benefits on Patreon. I'll be re restructuring that and adding more. And also check out the links below to our supporters like Aquatic Arts who are still delivering awesome fish and plants during this uh, time of lockdown across the country. Also, don't forget to uh, check out the description. I think I'll be linking some things like uh, maybe some slime coat or basically, you know, tannins, catapa leaves, things like that that will help this whole system. And we can get into those chemicals later. But leave me a comment if you think you want to know about even more detail or just let me know if, you know, this was even too much detail. This was too wordy. This is such a huge topic, but it's so important to know uh, at least how it works in some of your fish. So thank you so much. Please take care of your critters, your plants, your fish, your shrimp, uh, your pets. Uh, get some food and stuff. If you haven't gotten already, stock up a bit. And, uh, you know, take care of the people in your life, obviously, also. And before all that, take care of yourself. Take time, relax, watch the fish tank, watch these videos, whatever it is that gets you through the night. Uh, do that, and hopefully... Uh, if you take care of yourself, you can take care of all these other things. And uh, lastly, be kind. Uh, I think if half of us did half the things I'm talking about, taking care of others and, and the creatures in our care uh, with this level of fervor and interest, uh, I think half of us doing half of this half the time would make our world twice as good. So remember that. Take care of yourselves, be safe, wash your hands, swim on, and treat the slime coats of the fishies you love uh, like they are a jewel, because they are. I'll talk to you later, and uh, hang in there, swim on, goodbye.